Good evening, everyone. Tonight is December 28th, 2022. It is 6.30 p.m. And I would like to call to order the Columbus City Council meeting. Uh, our first order of business will be the Pledge of Allegiance. Please join us if you care to. The next item on our uh, agenda is the approval of the consent agenda. Would someone care to make the motion? This is Janet. Um, I move to approve consent agendas number four and six. This is Sue, all second. It's moved and seconded. Any discussion or question? I'll do a roll call vote all evening as we're on the interactive program she again. She Shelley, aye. Sue, aye. Janet, aye. And Jesse, aye. The next issue is public open forum. Is there anybody in the audience or online who would care to speak at the public open forum? Seeing and hearing none, we'll move on. Uh, our next item is a planning commission report with uh, the chairman, Ron Hanegraaff, doing the report for us tonight. Good evening, Mayor, Council Members. <coughs> Excuse me. Nervous getting up for a mic. So. <laughs> well, I, I, it's hard to start off tonight to review what we had on the 21st because you all were there. But uh, I'll start out uh, the evening with uh, two motions concerning the application of Classic Construction Incorporated on behalf of three bacon Beacon Holding LLC Blaine Brothers. The first motion concerned the Bonfire Farmstead Preliminary Flat. There wasn't much of a discussion amongst the Planning Commission and following the findings of facts and recommendation reports by Dean Johnson of Resource Strategies Corporation and Kevin Bettner, Bittner, a city engineer, the Commission sends this application to the Council with our recommendations. Want me to go on, or are you going to deal with that? Let's do? deal with that while we're mm -hmm. on the top of the top of mind. So, has anyone? Most of us were at the meeting, or we had zoomed in. Does anyone have any questions or discussions for the chairman? Not on the first one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anybody? Nope. All right. Well, then I, I'll make the motion to approve the Bonfire Farmstead preliminary plat, subject to the conditions one through 10 of the planner's report dated 12 2022 and the city engineer's comments listed in the report dated 12 2022 Is there a second? This is Sue, I'll second. Now, any other questions or discussions? Hearing none, I'll call for the vote. Shelley, aye. Sue, aye. Janet, aye. And Jesse, aye. All right, Mr. Chair. All right, the second motion concerning Blaine Brothers was a truck align plan unit development conditional use permit. After the Planning Commission's public hearing on December 7th, 2022, the applicant submitted a revised landscaping plan, which drawings, I don't know if you have it in your packet or not, on pages 40 through 44 of your packet showing the appearance from Hornsby. This is the landscaping. Uh, there was some discussion concerning a little more screenings, such as more trees on Hornsby Street. And Dean Daly, president and CEO of Blaine Brothers, did not see an issue with that. Uh, the commission believed that this could be handled by the city staff. The Planning Commission did approve this PUD and CUP on the findings of facts and recommendations, again, by Dean Johnson of RSC and Kevin Bittner, the city engineer. Is there anyone who has questions for the chairman? I, have, I just have one. It's just a curious question. I don't know if you can answer it or, or if somebody else can, but I, I did drive by the existing truck line business 
and they have like five stalls for service and this one is 19 so I was just curious what the if there was another business that you're combining with it or is this just organic growth that you're expecting once you uh, move to your new location uh, you must be talking over my shoulder here yes I am <laughs> <laughs> would you come up to the mic please identify yourself for the record and tell us what you know Thank you, Mr. Mayor and Council. Ron. Um, organic growth is what we are planning on and what we've experienced um, over time. Okay. All right, Anyone? yeah, I think that was the only, really, the only question I had. Anyone else? Um, I have a question. So. I know the Planning Commission, in particular, Commissioner King was asking for more in the way of landscaping. And I was thinking that maybe our intent wasn't very clear, so I thought I would I would try to clarify that. And maybe it is clear. But you know, I think as I th as I drove by the site and kind of envisioned what would be parked out there, what I don't know is what the trucks are gonna look like. So I was the one that submitted the pictures of the fence that Bona Brothers has. And if you peek through that fence, it's, it's a real truck graveyard in there. <laughs> You're glad the fence is there because it's pretty, pretty bad behind it. Um, and so I, I don't have a good sense of how beat up <laughs> the trucks are that get, that get brought in for, um, for repair. And I think that part of the concern, at least that I have, and, and perhaps the, the planning commission was, you know, the, the um, drafts of the pictures of the renditions that we got show what look like brand new semis parked there, but I bet they don't look like that. So as you're driving down Hornsby, I think the intent was, is there a way to break up that, that view and maybe it's not that bad maybe they really like yes they have bent frames but you'd never know that if you drove by them so could could you just give us a sense of kind of what the appearance of the trucks typically are that you do work on and and if they're you know if, if you if a person was to drive by there would it look like a bunch of trucks waiting to be fixed or would it look like a bunch of trucks just parked there or a mix <laughs> Uh, I guess I would have to answer there there could be a mix there there could be everything uh, from worst case scenario a crashed truck uh, or a, or a trailer that had been rolled over that needs to be straightened mm -hmm. uh, to the prettiest equipment that you'll see on the highways um, okay. to fire trucks to um, whatever type of vehicle uh, so it it can be very wide ranging. Um, uh, Sue mentioned going by the existing truck line facility. I'm not sure when that was, but if you look at the equipment around there, there is uh, um, there is a fence around that one, um, but that's on a much smaller scale. There's a lot of stuff. Well, normally there's several vehicles parked out front mm -hmm. uh, that that's not fenced in. Um, there is. Um, there's a, a large amount of work that goes on at that facility, um, but I hope you certainly didn't see a disaster there. Um, no, and know, it wasn't maybe, very busy, and that was today. I, I drove by. Okay, there. It, I did notice. I went by there today my own self, and and uh, I was surprised at the lack of equipment sitting in there. Mm -hmm. um, they they were all inside, but uh, well, there was some out back, but uh, not out front like normal. So again, there there are variations to what we'll see. Okay, so so you know, I guess what I was thinking, and again, we you know we're not trying to design anything for you, but what I was thinking is that if you could put something so that as you drive down Hornsby, it doesn't have to be invisible. It doesn't have to be that. It doesn't have to be as invisible as the example that I gave you. But even if you had a few panels of fence in between conifers, in between some, you know, deciduous trees. I mean, as you're driving down there, you're not your eye isn't gonna be picking up all the, you might see some truck shapes behind there and stuff, but you're not gonna see a bunch of trucks that may or may not look pretty beat up sitting there waiting for um, uh, to be repaired. So 
I, I think that was the intent, and I think that Commissioner King was right that what we saw, at least in the pictures, doesn't really adequately um, screen that. So I don't know if you've had any more thoughts or chance to think about that, but I, I just wanted you to understand, I think, what the intent was that we weren't we weren't trying to do your landscaping. This wasn't sort of like to beautify the <laughs> the um, uh, the property. It was more to just uh, camouflage what might be some beat up looking trucks from the people that are driving down. And however you can do that, um, I think you know would be fine with us. Let me add. If everybody looks on page forty. Three of this packet. <clears throat> I see a bunch of regular or deciduous trees. So that means the leaves are going to fall off. So half the year you're going to see straight through. Would you be willing to turn those into Christmas trees? So as they mature, that gives you a better. That breaks up the, and I don't know how you, who does this? Does the planner landscape, do it? Landscape, landscape architect? It'll be a landscape architect. I'm sure he's got one. So can there be something adjusted to that? Get rid of the maple trees or whatever they are. Put in a few more Christmas trees that will have good coverage all year long. And then, and what about, so of course there will be some trucks that were hit by trains. And there will be many that are just need their wheels adjusted or whatever. Can you park the good ones towards the highway or towards Hornsby Street? And if the really bad ones, the train wrecks are up by the building, the trucks that are parked out beyond would be camouflaging. We have one picture here on page 41, 42. And it shows decent looking trucks parked up against Hornsby Street. So that would help camouflage the, the ones that really need the extra work. And maybe between the two of the, between the Christmas tree switch and the decent looking vehicles parked against Hornsby, that would cover up whatever ugliness there is from the ones that really need to be heavily repaired. On page 44, we have a drawing with some Christmas trees, some deciduous, some decent looking trucks parked there. And in my mind, that would be a pretty good thing without doing too much more landscaping. And that can just be a issue that you bring up with your people. Who parks where and what? Anybody else? I have a few comments. One is that the concept for the highway district, we worked really hard on that. We talked ad nauseum on what the zoning should be. It was supposed to be something where people want to get off the highway and come to Columbus, a, a known quantity at this point, because our name is on the bridge. We had certain things that we wanted done in that area where we wanted to improve the area and make it look inviting to come off the highway. When we were presented with loves, um, I was adamant that they not turn it into a truck stop because I wanted people to feel that they could get off the highway and, and come to the track and hopefully something uh, on the northeast corner of our, our quadrant. Uh, did, adding another trucking firm to this makes me feel like we're going in a direction that I, I feel really uncomfortable with, and I have not had a chance to really talk about that until this point. Um, I did know that when we had the, <clears throat> the preliminary concept meeting, um, I, I was against the idea of having a trucking firm in there. Um, they... The, the, the fact that you want to have the building white, which <clears throat> we have not traditionally allowed that in that area since we did the zoning, and we had a 
real ruckus over having a white building for one of our other existing businesses, Bear Homes, um, they were forced to change the color um, so that it wasn't quite so fluorescent white um, and would not be sticking out um, in the landscape of Columbus. Um, I don't believe that having white buildings with red stripes on a trucking firm is the same as having um, bare homes have a small blue area to their building or McDonald's having their arches and that type of thing. I think that that, um, that particular uh, item got glossed over because we said, well, we want you to be able to hide things. Well, you can't hide a, this, that size of a building. When Viking came in uh, uh, to our area and they were in the general area, uh, they also had white on their building and they generously uh, changed the colors uh, to match the, the surrounding area uh, so that it didn't you know, stick out. It's a beautiful building and they have accents that make it stand out, but, but they did change it. And I, and I challenge anybody to go up there and look at that building um, versus even Bear Homes, which Bear Homes did you know, tone down the white. Um, but I feel like we are making exceptions for this that are leading us down a dangerous path. One of the things that I'm really concerned about is that we actually asked people from, from uh, Blaine Brothers, you know, why there are so many places for trucks? And um, it just seemed like it was really excessive for the business. And we were answered by saying, well, we don't have an app that allows people to stay, you know, at our place or park their, their trucks there. That didn't answer the question. The question is, if you are going to be developing your business organically, does that mean you're going to then be able to um, eventually work it into like a truck parking situation? We know what, there's articles in the Minneapolis Tribune, there's articles everywhere about how the truckers are not able to get places to park. We in putting gloves in, we gave them a place to park. So my feeling is that Columbus has done their business as a fringe, as a fringe community to you know, address that. Um, and Love, Love's offers us you know, restaurants and a place for people to get off and, and, and explore you know, part of Columbus. Um, it's a good addendum to the track. We were also told, you know, well, why do you allow the, the track to go and have lights up and that sort of thing? You can't even come close to what the track has given to Columbus. The, the taxes alone are, are, are bread and butter. And then, besides the fact they're a good neighbor, they constantly come to us and offer you know, uh, little, little perks for the, the community that they don't have to do. So, there is no comparison between Blaine Brothers and Loves, and there is no comparison between Blaine Brothers and the track. In conclusion, I want to mention the fact that the city planner has made mention that we are now setting precedent, and that if that's what we want in Columbus, that's what we're going to get. We're going to get a truck center. We're going to have trucks coming down Lake Drive. We're going to have trucks being fixed on Lake Drive. We're going to have trucks uh, being fixed, you know, along the highway. And that's what we're going to be known for. And I think we've worked really hard to um, make that quadrant um, important and something that we wanted to represent Columbus. And I just don't know that this is the direction that we should have taken. And it's gone a long way down this road before I was able to make some kind of comment. And I'm sorry that it comes so late. But I, I feel like um, I would not be representing the people of Columbus if I did not say this. So that's all I have to do. Thank you. Anyone else? Um, I just want to make one comment kind of related to that, Shelley. And I know that, um, you know, it has been a concern of not just um, people on the council and the planning commission of all the trucks in Columbus. Um, but I did go to our ordinance to look, you know, what exactly, how does, how does something like this qualify? How would we be able to say no? And there really isn't. I mean, our ordinance says vehicles, and there's no definition of what a vehicle is. 
A vehicle is something that transports, doesn't give the size or anything. So, I mean, that's what our ordinance is, and that's what we have to. That's how I base my decision. And I know I, you know, I could discourage it, but that's what our ordinance is, and. Um, I feel like they've done a really good job. Um, I thought you did a really good job on your documentation and everything that you've done, you know, working with the city and the planners and all of that. So, and I think you're a great, reputable company. Um, so I guess, you know, I'm, I'm a little bit torn too, just because of that, the trucks. And I think in the first place, we, when we listen to your, um, the concept plan, we didn't hear 20 to 30 trips per day. And when I heard that last week, I don't know if it was last week or the week before, I thought, wow, that's a lot of trucks. Um, but it's in an area that is, it, it's not affecting the community in the way that, like, for example, Lake Drive is. That area is, it's right off the freeway, they're gonna come they're going to go by Loves and those other little businesses there, and then they're going to get back on the freeway. So, I mean, I just don't feel like the impact is as hard on the entire community um, as some of the other areas is. Well, I, my, I disagree because when the asphalt company went in, um, they cut down a bunch of trees, and that increased the noises that we get from the, the uh, highway. And I think that having additional truck traffic uh, coming specifically to be fixed or to be staying overnight is going to be a problem. I don't think that it's going to, I don't think our intent was ever to have it as a parking lot for trucks. And I have not been convinced that it's not going to be used as that. And I may be proved wrong. And in three years, you can let me know. But um, as far as way, the way you turn this down is you, you know, from the very beginning, you say this doesn't seem to fit. Certainly, we don't allow a white building in, in the area. We had wanted to stay um, neutral uh, coming up the highway. And at and, and minimum, the color should not be any brighter or any lighter than what we held the um, bare homes to. Um, it's just not, it's not fair to them. Because um, we, we made a big deal. It cost them a lot of money. So those are the reasons why I would say no. Let me ask, uh, I think you had told us at the last planning commission meeting that you do not intend to have people parking there and living there and staying overnight. Is that still the case? That is true, that's correct. Well, they will not, that's not what we're, that's not what we have that parking lot for. Uh, there is a need for truck parking, there's no question. Uh, that is not what we intend this lot to be used for. And I appreciate that they put in the new wording about not sleeping in your truck, but that isn't what the problem is. The problem is people don't have a place to park their trucks. Right. That's why and, they're parked on Minneapolis streets and all over downtown. Right. And so now, you know, there's been an article about the fact that it would be really nice if people would have, you know, a, a, a parking lot for people to drive to, drop their trailer off or whatever, and then come and get their trailer when they need it. And that's what I'm having a problem with. Do you have a lot of place for uh, cars also? And I, I have a hard time seeing, you know, that that many places are needed for uh, educational purposes. So I'm just saying that even if your intent right now is, is pure, um, I see in the future a lot of morphing. And I'm the council member that always uses that word, morphing. And um, I just, I just feel like uh, the amount of land that's used, the, the, the amount of pavement that's used to house uh, trucks, and now you're saying that sometimes the trucks aren't looking so great and everything, that's what you're going to see coming up the highway. So I'm just saying that that's, I, if we do this, then there is no reason why. All the other trucking companies, and we've had other people that are interested in Lake Drive too, come up here and we will be trucking central. And if that's what Columbus wants to be, I understand. And, it, and it'll get us some money. You know, we were told by our banker that we only had to increase our base by 5% a year. And we far outstripped that. And the problem is when we outstripped it, we also are losing land because we don't have that much left to develop. 
So I just, I just want to say, I mean, the city planner has basically caved to the trucking idea. And if that's what is wanted, I just can't vote for that because I, I promised the people that the truck traffic would go down in Columbus. <laughs> But again, it's not affecting Columbus, it's on the Forest Lake side. And also, here's a $10 million building that will be what everybody sees from everywhere. And you don't pay for a building like that without a parking lot and without customers who are using the services offered. And we've been pretty reassured. Everything we've asked for was agreed to. And I understand your concerns, I really do. But it's zoned for that. Even the parking, the car parking, that's Columbus zoning that requires them to have that many car park spots there. You know, you could sell that property and build a coffee shop next to it. It would be better off than having 200 car park spots. But our regulations require, whatever the numbers are, that he has it. and. And I hope you're busy enough in five or 10 years that every spot is full and business is good because then we know you can pay your taxes. So anything else from anybody? I think the only other thing I wanna say is I remember you saying, Dean, that your white actually has gray tones in it. And one of the things that was helpful when we were working with Bear Homes was we actually got a brick that was painted so you could actually kind of see how bright it was. Their first white was really bright white and the second white wasn't so bright. And I wish I would have thought of this before, but I mean, that might, you know, assuage some of your concerns, Shelley, if you saw it and it wasn't bright white, it was more in line with what you had, um, you know, settled with, with, with bare homes. I, I, if I'm remembering that wrong, please correct me, but I thought you said that it wasn't pure white, it was, some very light shade of gray put in with the white to kind of tone it down. I, I should have also thought about that earlier and, may, and maybe brought, it, brought a sample. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, um, I don't want to be quoted on this, but I believe that the name, the paint uh, name has gray in it. Mm -hmm. um, again, don't quote me on that, but it, it's... Right. So, I mean, I I don't disagree with the problem with trucks, but I don't consider your business a trucking business. I would disagree with that categorization. And because they are being brought there, they're being repaired, they're being brought off, and the location of it being in so, such close proximity to the freeway, I, I, I agree with Sue that it's not, it's not gonna pose a hardship like trucking companies that are going in and out you know, with, with the asphalt plant 500 times a day or, you know, roaring through residential parts of our, of our um, city to get to Lake Drive. So I, um, I don't have that same concern. I do think that if you could, you know, figure out some way to break up the view of the parked um, vehicles for waiting to be repaired, that would be, that would be a big plus. That's, and I think that that would go a long way towards um, at least, you know, the only concern that I have. I also want to commend you because the one thing that I did hear that I thought was really generous is, was the training programs that your, that your company offers. Um, and so I think you're, you're well on your way to being a good citizen um, just based on the fact that you're investing in kids that are trying to get into the trades and providing a place for them to do internships and, and learn how to do that, so. Anything else, anyone? Mr. Mayor and council members, uh, the applicant has presented uh, two new renderings. You have a, a rendering before you, and um, I'm not sure who would be able to explain, um, but I can briefly go over what uh, Dean wrote me in the email, so if I need any corrections, please. Please welcome, and I'll welcome any comments. Um, he's indicated that um, there are new renderings for architectural plans that show the roof cap in a dark prefinished metal, um, not white, 
and uh, he he'd indicated that he wasn't going to be at the meeting, um, but he wanted the rendering to come before you because it has to be um, accept those changes have to be accepted um, by the city council, and those would be the new architectural plans. So, if there's something I've missed in your um, plans that you've changed, um, I'm only aware of um, the top roof panels or the prefinished metal panels. And Mr. Mayor and Council, when you're ready to make a motion, you should reference uh, revisions dated 12-27-22. That's uh, at the bottom of the plans that were handed out. There's two sides to that plan. Um, I did have one other question. Um, when I was looking at the findings of facts, it references um, still, at least the most recent version I have, the eight foot, um, what is it called? Like an eight foot brick wall that I thought Dean had said that wasn't going to be there. So my question is, is that supposed to be there or not? Um, it says, uh, site plan also reveals an eight feet tall precast screening walls north and south of the easterly building elevation. And I thought I remember him saying that that wasn't going to be part of the site plan. Do you remember? Or is that, or, and he was referring to it related to the gate because he changed some of the wording on the entrance gates. So maybe it was just specific to that. But I thought if it's not going to be in there, we should get it out of there since it's part of what we're going to hold you account, account, accountable to. I, I believe the renderings and uh, plans that you have before you now uh, do reflect uh, our, uh, I guess, latest revision. Uh, Elizabeth just mentioned the roof cap. You'll notice just the uh, just the roof cap over the top. It was drawn in on the original drawing as dark. Mm -hmm. On this one that you received yesterday, I believe, or today, uh, it is a white cap. Um, it's. It does go along with everything our other buildings. Um, that's why I asked them to make that change. If we have to go with the dark cap, um, that's not my preferred, um, but uh, it does still tie in with all of the stone uh, and dark windows and the dark cap is what's shown. That's what. I'm sorry. The dark cap is what's shown, and that's what Dean reviewed. Okay. The the uh, I believe the rendering showing. Yeah. Okay. See. Do you all have these? Yes. Yep. All the council does. I'll have these in there. Yep. Okay. If I can explain then, so the center cap is black. If you look beyond that, the lower portion of the roof, it is white above the red stripe. The black in the center top cap would not change, only on the... Uh, so above Truckaline, the signage, mm -hmm. that black cap would not change. And in fact, we might... Uh, well, the white, the white stripe out the edges would uh, be our preferred. That's what this was sent today. Again, it matches our other facilities. It's not a big change at all. It's is it four inches over the top, or six. Six inches down the front uh, is the roof cap. Mr. Mayor and Council, just so everybody's clear, both the applicant and the City Council, that by submitting this revision, if the Council approves it, this is what will be built, right? Mm -hmm. So, unless you come back and amend it. So, we want to be clear that by submitting it, if the Council approves it, this is the plan. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly why I wanted to get this in. Uh, I apologize for the last minute, um, but again, just showing the white so there wasn't any question later. But do you know, is the, is the eight foot tall precast screening walls north and south, is that still part of the site plan? Yes, it is. From, from 
uh, from the interstate view uh, on the north and south side of the building, there are screening walls. Okay. On the east side entry gate off of 150th, uh, there were screening walls drawn in there okay. with the way the gates, uh, the way we want them to function, mm -hmm. they're, they're code in and out. Mm -hmm. We would not be able to have the screening walls there where the gates have to sit. Okay. There isn't room with the parking and the rest. Okay. To have. So that was the part that he took out was on the easterly side. Correct. Okay. The east side gates, yes. Okay. Thank and you. there was a center island added in there to, again, accommodate the gates and the, and the uh, code. Okay. Uh, okay. Device. So let's go back to our drawing here. So what the change is is that this line, this top cap, has become black. We're on the bottom of page BB one. That was, uh, Mr. Mayor, that was shown black on the original drawing. Uh, the yeah. entire top cap was shown black. Right. Then you have the red going across, and then white behind your red truck line name above the front doors. Correct. So it's, it's, bl it's black here. Mm -hmm. It was black. Now he wants it white. It was black. He wants it white. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Does everybody understand mm -hmm. all of that? I got it. So back to Janet's question, you're still going to have the eight-foot precast screening walls on the north and the south of the easterly portion elevation. That all stays the same. North and south, but not easterly. But not easterly, okay. So the finding as written is accurate. It's correct, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So is there anything we haven't asked, Councillor? No, Mr. Mayor, um, I think it's just, uh, it warrants some, since this plan's been offered as a revision, it warrants some discussion at the council whether it's acceptable or not. Yeah. Anybody object to the white above the red? I would prefer black. Do you have a picture of what the black, I, I don't remember, I didn't ever remember that it was black. I was trying to find if we had a picture of it, and I don't see a picture of it. Yep, there it is right there. Yeah, I got one here. Do you? Is it in that big packet that you had? Oops. Over here, Jim. Yes, sir. Ah, oh, okay. I got it. No, <laughs> it's good enough. That's this one, right? Okay, so I don't think it's a big, big difference. Because we still have all the black above here. I know. I just have a question on why why did you change that little bit to white from black? Is there a reason? Mm -hmm. uh, our guys could answer um, probably better than I can. I'm very, very particular on uh, many different things about our buildings, our trucks, and our businesses. Um, it, again, it's how I've preferred the look over the years. and. Um, we, we have made, uh, again, many other changes to this already in regards to the, the additional windows, the, the dark stone, um, not that any of us, not that any of these adjustments hurt us, but it is slightly different. Um, again, all of our buildings have that white roof cap on them, and, and I Tell our people I have different things going on in my head that aren't always <laughs> so I Okay. I don't have a problem with the white. Yeah, I don't either. Um, I have one other question for Elizabeth or, or Bill. So to Shelley's concern about trucks that might end up being parked there, maybe not slept in, but parked there, it looks to me that the way that Dean has worded the the conditions and the findings, 
we're eliminating that possibility. Is that your read too, or does that need to be strengthened to address that concern? I mean, he's in the findings, he's like, he says, uh, truck and trailer parking on the property is limited to customer owned trucks and trailers that are being serviced at truck align and towing vehicles. No trucks or trailers are stored on the property for sale or salvage. And then in the conditions, the recommended conditions, um, he kind of restates that same that same same language. Um, all tr truck and trailer parking on the property. This is number twelve of the condition shall be limited to temporary parking associated with repair of customer trucks and trailers. Customers shall not be permitted to sleep in or otherwise occupy trucks or trailers while waiting for service repairs. So this really prohibits what Shelley is concerned about. Is that correct? As long as we enforce it. <laughs> yep, uh, Mr. Mayor and Council, I would agree. It's tightly written. Um, the thing that is not provided for in there is just random parking, so parking for parking purposes. They, they're, you know, my view of this would be you would have a code enforcement action or a, or a condition enforcement action if if you found that people were just parking there and not customers and not not being repaired. Mm -hmm. Anybody staying overnight wouldn't be allowed. Right. That, that could be enforced against. So I, I think the condition is well written. Okay. Thank you. All right, everyone. I'll make the motion to approve. Blaine Brothers Truck Alliance CUP for a PUD subject, subject to conditions 1 through 22 of the planner's report dated 12-22-2022 and, and the revision dated 12-27-22 of the city engineer's comments listed on the report dated 12-02-2022. Uh, this did is Sue, I'll second. Oh. Pardon me? Did I say it correctly? Yep. Yes. You did good. All right. And is there a second? All right. This is Sue, I'll second. All right. We have a motion and a second. Now, anybody else have anything else to say? I do. I just want to say, is there a way that we can... I, I don't see what the Planning Commission asked for, which was more, more screening. So, and I don't... I'm happy to delegate that to the staff to work with you on that, but can we add that to the motion so that that doesn't get forgotten? Sure, uh, Mr. Mayor and Council, with reference to the landscaping condition, mm -hmm. you can add as approved by city staff. And, and I'm scrambling to see where that is. I see the uh, approved land, I think it's condition 11, but with reg I, th I think if you just, Add that to the, the motion. Or number 10, the one right before it, I think, the screening plan. Right, either one, okay. but as approved by city staff, and then uh, we'll have to sign off at this level. I think. I mean, I'm feeling, Elizabeth, you guys have a sense of what we're looking for, right? Yes. Okay. I don't want to hold you up, but I would like to see more. You can work it out with her. You need to amend your motion. And if so you agree we'll with that, amend the motion to include landscaping plan as approved by city staff. Here, here. Is there a second? This is Sue. I'll second. All right. I'll call for the vote. Shelley, nay. Sue, aye. Janet, aye. And Jesse, aye. And to be clear, it's probably screening and landscaping. It's a combination of both. So. Yep. Right. Yeah. Right. And so, I know everybody knows the speaker, but just for our, our record, uh, your name, sir? Dean Daly. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Start planting those Christmas trees. <laughs> All right. Moving right along. Uh, that was quick. That was quick. <laughs> Well, it's been on to number two. It's been eight months, so Ron still more or twelve tight. months. All right, go ahead, Ron. All right, the second item on the agenda was a public hearing concerning the commercial industrial district moratorium amending city code seven A in the CI district on Lake Drive. And, uh, I would first like to thank the assistant city attorney Megan Morgan's, I mean, Megan Rogers, for her work and guidance in leading us through this process. 
as the council knows it was a long process and since all the council viewed the public hearing on december twenty first i will not bore you with line by line and get to the facts there were three issues that night i think that stood out in the public hearing and and we adjusted them and i see they were readjusted by the city attorney in that letter i think he wrote on the twenty third of december in your packet but the first one uh, that we came to is um, uh, the first was in section 7A750, commercial industrial CI light outdoor display and screening. Uh, I don't know if you have it in your packet, but on 68 of the page 68 of the packet, item B, outdoor storage limitations and requirements line number four. The outdoor storage was set at 30% of the site, excluding retail products sold outdoors and fleet vehicles. The commission did not see any issue in uh, bringing that percentage up to 50%. The second issue is in regard to section 7A801, page 69 of the packet. The discussion was about setbacks from the CI light districts to the rural residential area. That was 10 feet, but the commission agreed to move it back to the original 35 feet with the understanding that two businesses abutting each other in the CI light district would have a setback of 10 feet. And there was also a clause in ordinance on page 69 in the section 7A824, performance standards for contractor shops with contractor yard limit. Item A was removed, which stated spacing requirements. No contractor shop with accessory contractor yard limited shall be located less than a quarter of a mile from another contractor shop with accessory contractor yard limited. The commission, uh, the commission did not think this was an issue. So those are the uh, three issues, I think, that were discussed that night that gained a little uh, motion from the public hearing. And I know a lot of you were on, on a video that night, but uh, I think that the public hearing went pretty good and that the public was pretty well in tune with the changes that were going on. And, and as you are aware, the Planning Commission voted unanimously to approve the changes to 7A of City Code and Zoning Map Amendment CI in the district. A lot of talking there. <laughs> Unless you've seen something else, that's about the three issues, I think, that night. And I think the quarter of a mile, or was it three quarters of a mile? Quarter of a mile. Quarter of a mile. I think that came up as an option. It was placed in there, I think. What I remember of that was we were offered that um, when we were concerned about expansion of heavy use businesses. And I'd suggested that we could adopt a performance standard like we did in the LI district over um, in the freeway district that in that area, we don't allow another asphalt concrete production facility within two miles of the existing one. So I said, well, we could do something similar. I think Megan came back with the quarter mile suggestion. And then after that, I think Bill um, swaged our fears about, about uh, creating nonconformities by saying we could um, allow any a business that had a valid CUP in effect at the time we adopt this ordinance to continue on as conforming, which then eliminated the need of having that quarter mile thing. So I think that was just left over and it doesn't need to be in there anymore. That's the way I remember it. Mr. Mayor and Council, that's correct. Uh, once, once the um, existing businesses were legally grandfathered rather than grandfathered as non-conforming uses, the spacing requirement wasn't needed because the direction of the council is you didn't want um, contractor shops established other than as allowed today. Right. So we found a different solution than spacing. Everybody who's got a, a valid CUP as of tonight will continue as a legally conforming use. And that allows them to get financing and refinance and sell their properties and not have to identify it as non-conforming. So then the spacing requirement's not. Right. So then, then what protects us against having the heavy 
heavier uses in that <clears throat> non light because it's not li it's not listed as a permitted or a conditional use so if it's not listed it's not permitted it's no longer allowed unless it's unless the council decides that they want to permit it is that correct the council would have to amend the yeah. code there would have to be a code amendment to allow it so it's right. a, it, the door is essentially shut other than those businesses that are already existing I did have one question kind of related to that though in um, so when I look at the when I look at the list of conditional uses, it lists. Um, let's see if I can find it here. It talks about the the some of the uses that we aren't allowing, but it it qualifies conditional um, contractor shop with accessory contractor yard operating pursuant to an approved conditional use permit in the CI district on or before December 28th. So I get that. Mm -hmm. The one thing I wasn't sure of, and I brought this up with Elizabeth, is that there's a couple of trucking terminals down near the mixed use, and it's they're not listed. I, I don't know what we categorize those as. I call them trucking terminals. I don't know what the real category is, but I don't think the category is listed here, and they aren't called out as having being, uh, if they were legally established, they continue to be legally established. And I just didn't want, I just want clarification on was that purposeful or did we just miss that? So looking at um, looking at the conditional use permits, the, the two businesses that were brought up, um, we, we looked at their conditional use permits. We determined that we are gonna determine the use by what is recorded on the property. And in the one case, it's not recorded as a truck terminal, it's recorded as a contractor shop with yard. And looking at its use, um, it is listed under C as in Charlie, under contract shop with contractor yard limited. Okay. Um, the other one is actually limited, is actually listed as not a contractor yard, but a building trade office, along with vehicle repair and service. So because there are three uses recorded on the property, two of which are um, on the list for um, conditional use, and the other one contractor yard, we felt that they would fit. Um, the one item that is will be presented differently will be homes. So I there we talked through this. If someone uses a home as a residence on Lake Drive and they want to add another room, in other words, expand the footprint, adopting this ordinance makes them legal non they're legal non-conforming today. And when you adopt this ordinance, they're still going to be legal non-conforming. If they come to you and they say, we want to add a room, they're going to use the variance process. They're not going to use the conditional use permit process. If it's a commercial business and they happen to be legal non-conforming, they will use the conditional use permit process. And then the council will determine whether you feel the expansion is appropriate or not. And, and if you feel it's appropriate, you're going to grant the ex expansion. And if you feel that it doesn't meet the criteria that we've listed out, then then you would indicate to them that you didn't think um, the expansion met the criteria of the ordinance. So you've had a, you have a couple car carve outs depending on what the situation is, um, and depending on what the situation is, we'll take that route. Mr. Mayor and Council, and, and this was the discussion that that Elizabeth had with Megan Rogers and then I had with Megan Rogers. So we, we vetted all three of these instances. We feel comfortable with the direction um, in, in your adoption of this tonight. Uh, to be clear, anybody who has an existing home and they want to use it for commercial purposes, they not only have to meet the zoning code, but they also have to meet the building code. Yep. And so that may require the building be sprinkled. It may require other life safety improvements. So it's not an easy thing to convert a residence to a commercial use, mm -hmm. just to be clear. So then, Elizabeth, just for my own clarification, what I recall in the past is when a legally non-conforming residential property wants to do more than just maintenance, I, I, I mean, I don't... We, we've struggled with that because when you're talking about a variance, there has, has to meet the six criteria. So it seems to me like 
it would it, they wouldn't be able to get a variance either i mean and, which is okay with me i mean I'm, i i get that we're not we're trying to not have more investment in residential property there because it just creates conflicts with the commercial property but I, i'm i'm just wanting to make sure i understand it it's it's the same as it's been in the past when people have wanted to expand they have they will be faced with the same challenges that we've had in the past Yes, that is correct. They will be chased. Same, same challenges, same hardship, practical difficulties, standard. Um, I think the last one um, had indicated that, you know, if you didn't do the repairs, because it was beyond the the amount, you know, in the ordinance, um, it was going to cause, convert, you know, severe hardship. And I think you granted that variance. So I think mm -hmm. depending on the circumstances, uh, we'll determine whether they meet the hardship criteria. Okay. And Mr. Mayor and Council, just to maybe put a fine point on this part of the discussion, the Council and the Planning Commission and giving its direction on this, this portion of the discussion made it clear that you wanted existing commercial businesses to have a way to continue to be legally conforming, to even have the opportunity to expand. You did not provide that same opportunity for residential structures because the intent of the city for at least 20 years has been to phase those out yeah. on Lake Drive. Correct. Correct. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So would someone like to start making the motions? Mr. Mayor, Council Member, um, I, I would like you to, um, you have a handout that's dated uh, December 23rd, and um, on the second and third pages are the motions. And to, to start off um, on the second motion, it's, uh, it will not be 22, it will not be 2212, it'll be 2213. Um, so the first motion does identify with 2211. Second motion identifies with 2213. The next motion is 2214. And then you're going to have resolution 39, 40, and 41. I didn't get all that because I just found the page. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Okay. So, so first, first motion. Um, looking at the numbers, it's going to be 2211. Mm -hmm. The second motion is not going to be 2212. It's going to be 2213. Okay. And then the next one is 2214. Okay. And the last three are resolutions, and those numbers are 39, 40, and 41. They do have to go in this order. Okay. I did want to make one comment, though, before we start all the motioning. Um, I know that this was a painful process for a lot of people, um, but I just wanted to thank uh, our assistant attorney, Megan, and the planning commission for a lot of hours of um, reviewing and changing and taking public feedback. Um, I think they did a great job, and I think we have accomplished what we wanted to in a very short amount of time. So. I just wanted to thank everybody who worked on that. And I just I just have a couple of questions that are more, I don't know, formatting or typo kinds of things. Do you want me to do that now or do it offline? They should be done now, so they're part of the record. Okay, so then I will go back to, So on the first, it doesn't have a page number on here, but the first page where it starts with the ordinance number 20-11, there's a typo on, on section one, the first line. I think it's meant to say by deleting those words, and it says toes words. <laughs> <I'm sorry. laughs> um, and then this is more, more an education for me. So we use the word implement in a lot of these things, and then sometimes we use farm implement, and sometimes we use regular implement. I'm not aware of any farm implement. I mean, nobody sells combines or things like that, but we do have a business that sells, you know, big, larger sort of lawn tractors and landscaping equipment and things like that. So, so in the, in the um, definitions, um, we have automotive trailer, travel trailer, farm implement, and construction machinery sales. And then I wondered whether you want to see farm or lawn care or landscaping, because I, I don't know, maybe I don't know the definition of a farm implement, but I just think of those as big combines and tillers and things like that, not what. Why don't we just strike the word farm? 
or just put implement yeah yeah implement works and then make it without and then it make further. it yeah. consistent throughout <clears throat> and then um, we have a definition um, for CI light district district but we don't have one for just the CI district unless we have it and it just isn't included here because it exists and we weren't changing it that's correct okay. it exists all right yep and I didn't go back to check that then on page um, there sorry these aren't page numbered um, if you can use sections. Uh, section 7A744, on the mineral extraction, do we need to have that be subject to the ordinance that talks about that? Don't uh, we have an ordinance that does? It doesn't need to be subject to because if the ordinance, the performance standards for mineral extraction would apply. Okay. Whether or not it's referenced. All right, then on the next page where it's going through, um, all of these headings say, commercial industrial then there's a big space and then it says ci light should there be light after the commercial industrial word in each of these sections it starts in 7a 748 commercial industrial light but then after that it just says commercial industrial big blank ci light um, the term is defined in the first reference uh, 7a 746 there's a parenthetical that shortens it to ci dash light in my just quick glance is that it's used as CI light then after that reference. I just think it's confusing because you just have commercial industrial, which is what we call the east side of the road. And, and I think the word light should be after that, or we should just use the abbreviated CI light. So it, it is right. The way she said it is right. Does that make sense? Yes, makes sense to me. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and then my other, um, so the other question I had is when it says, uh, so now I'm on section 7A747 on um, why. When it says expansion of nonconforming uses subject to the standards in section, is that section 7A481? I know right now it just says XX, but I just was wanting to make sure that I was going back to the right section. I'm looking for there. Where are you in the? Um, so it's section 7A-747. And then if you go down to Y mm -hmm. under there, it says expansion of nonconforming uses subject to the standards in section 7A XXX. And I'm thinking it's 7A481, which is defined earlier in this ordinance, but I didn't know if that was true. Or yeah, we'll fill that in. Um, okay. At, well, I, I just wanted to understand the, the, yep. the reference. So if that's the reference, then I understand it. If it's a yep. different reference, then I just. No, oh. that's correct. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. <clears throat> Let me think if there's anything else. Um, and then my other question is, so we have performance standards for the CI light. Do we have performance standards for just the CI district? But they're just not in here because we don't. They're, they're existing they're standards. Existing yeah. standards, okay. Yep, so they're in the code, but uh, not in the amendment. All right. And then um, now I am on, you can tell I really paid attention to yeah, this, this, right? Yeah, this is good. Sorry. Like Clean as we can get them. That's how boring my life has been lately. Okay, section 7A824, performance standards for contractor shops with contractor yard, and it says dash limited. Mm -hmm. But then underneath, the limited part is crossed off. So, and, and that carries through, so I don't, I don't, I think it shouldn't be crossed off. Well, the, um, I think the intent is that um, there should not be Based on the council's action tonight, there will not be new contractor shops um, other than limited. Mm -hmm. But so underneath that heading, it says all contractor shops with accessory contractor yard, and then it says limited, crossed out, established after. So I mean, the part that's confusing is that there would be no limited contract yards because we haven't defined that. So the only ones that would be established after December 28th, 22 would have to be limited, right? Because anything 
I am except that you have a provision that allows for the expansion of non conforming uses and i think yeah. meg and i discussed this ok and we agreed on the broader application to all contractors yards so if someone has a contractor's yard and they're under the exception the december twenty eighth exception they have the opportunity to come to the council under the expansion provision for a CUP or PUD to expand an existing contractor's yard. And so we wanted to make sure that these performance standards apply regardless whether it's contractor shop limited or it's an existing use expanding. So we did, we did discuss that. So the strike through is appropriate. But, but then, there's, but but then, then the there's, heading, but then should it be struck through in the heading too? Yes. Then Thank the you. heading should also have a strike. Okay. That's, that's what I think. Yeah. I that's, think. that's where the confusion is. Yep. 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 Okay. But we still need to have a definition of the limited because the definition is still there. Yes, because um, contractor yards limited are still allowed. Yes. Yep. Okay. It's the heavy contractors with all the piles of stuff that are not, other, other than those established. And those established could come <laughs> through for a CUP to expand that contractor's yard. It'll be up to the council whether that's an appropriate approval but they have that opportunity. In this case, in that case, the performance standards would apply. Okay, I'm getting close to the end of my list. <laughs> That's all right. So then my other question is, if you have a contractor shop, I'm sorry, yeah, contractor shop with a yard that's legally established today, and they're under, and they're under a CUP, can we impose these new performance standards <laughs> on them? I thought you couldn't change anything in their CUP until they reopen the CUP. Right, uh, you, you can't impose them retroactively, but if they come in to expand what they then, have today. Then they have to be under these. Then they would be under the performance. Okay, standards. got it. Yep. All right, I think this might be my last one. Um, so on the next page, under outdoor storage, um, it says outdoor storage and excavation as permitted by conditional use permit shall not encroach on any required setbacks or landscape yards. I don't understand, what do you mean landscape yards? I get setbacks, it doesn't encroach on its setback, but what does landscape well, yards mean? Oftentimes the landscaping and the setback are in the same space. Oh. Um, but if, if, for instance, the council would expand that landscape buffer for some reason, they can't, they can't store on top of the landscaping. They're, the okay. landscaping is kind of a clear zone. Okay, I, and, I just wasn't sure what the definition yeah. of a landscape yard was. You just yeah, mean the I, landscaping. You know, and, and it could just be landscaping, okay. if, if, that's, that's, if that makes more sense. Me. All right, I'm done. Thank you. I just have uh, one clarification, Bill. Um, for 787 or 824, the performance standards apply to both contractor yard limited and contractor yard. So I don't think you want to take out limited. I think you want to put, you want to add. The, the performance standards apply to both. Correct. Okay. And so... Oh, you're saying that if we strike limited, the interpretation might be that it doesn't apply. It doesn't to, apply to them, which I, I, think I don't, what I don't we'll think. Do is, I, I think we'll, we'll just clean this up so it's clear that it applies to it's both. It's both. That would yeah. be good. Yeah. <laughs> Anything else? Wasn't that enough? <laughs> <laughs> yes. All right. Anybody else? You want to start reading the, reading the motion? Two pages. Um, I'll try. So I would move to approve, oh, I'm sorry, move to adopt ordinance number 22-11 an ordinance amending city code revising or establishing use definitions, creating a CA light district, including outdoor storage performance standards, amending the conditional uses within the existing CI district, adding use specific performance standards for contractor yards, and allowing for expansion of non-conforming uses by conditional use permit and planned unit development application, thereby amending chapter 7A of the city code. Is there a second? This is Sue all second. Is there any other questions or discussions? I'll call for the vote. Shelley, aye. Sue, aye. Janet, aye. And Jesse, aye.
then I'll go on to say that I um, move to adopt ordinance number 22-13, an ordinance directing staff to amend city zoning map to rezone the described properties from commercial industrial to commercial industrial light. And this is Sue, I'll second. Any other questions? I'll call the vote. Shelley, aye. Sue, aye. Janet, aye. And Jesse, aye. And then moving on, I move to adopt ordinance number 22-14, an ordinance repealing ordinance number 2022-05, interim ordinance upon publication of ordinances 2022-11 and 2022-12. Um, it will be 13. 13, sorry. Okay. And this is Sue, I'll second. Any other discussion? We'll call the vote. Shelley, aye. Sue, aye. Janet, aye. And Jesse, aye. And I move to adopt resolution number 2022-39, authorizing summary publication of ordinance number 22-11, amending the city code. I'll second the motion. Any other questions? I'll call the vote. Shelley, aye. Sue, aye. Janet, aye. And Jesse, aye. And uh, move to adopt resolution number 2022-40. Uh, Thank you, I just wrote down four. Authorizing summary publication of ordinance number 22-12. 13. 13, sorry. Amending the city zoning map. This is Sue, I'll second. I'll call the vote. Shelley, aye. Sue, aye. Janet, aye. And Jesse, aye. And last but not least, move to adopt resolution number 2022-41, authorizing summary publication of ordinance number 22-13. 14. 14. 14, gosh. Oops. I'll second that, I'll call the vote. <laughs> Shelley, aye. Sue, aye. Janet, aye. And Jesse, aye on 22-14. Break out the champagne. How is it? <laughs> Everything good, Councilor? Yes, congratulations. We did. You said right. you wanted to get done by the end of the year, and here we are. Two days to go. All right. All right. Thanks, Ron. Well, thank All you. All right, Ron. We don't have to listen to 7A for a we, couple of years. Uh, we got a seat with your name on it up here for next time. <laughs> thank you. Yep, thank you. All right, we are moving on to... number 10 on our uh, agenda. And this is regarding chapter 16C, ordinance 2208, violations abatement code and chapter five public safety and public nuisance ordinance amendments 2209, two enclosures and our handouts. So Jessica's here to walk us through it. Yeah, so mayor and council, we have been working through amendments to chapter 16 C, which is our abatement code, as well as chapter five, which is our public nuisance and public safety code. Um, the council considered these amendments at our last meeting on December 14th. And at that time, there were minimal, if any, changes to chapter 16 C and some more changes um, to chapter five. So if we could just take Chapter 16C, um, the most recent version is in uh, the enclosure that was provided to you all. <clears throat> you have a new version of Chapter 5 that was handed out this evening. Um, mm. But with Chapter 16C, this would be Ordinance 2208, and there will have to be a second motion to approve the publication summary um, as presented. Happy to take any questions if you have any. So Jessica, you said that we have a new, is it just because it's red now or it, it, there was, was there any changes? Not to chapter 16 C. Okay. There were a couple changes, I believe from uh, council member Logren's comments to chapter five. Chapter five. But let's just maybe stay on 16 C first and right. see if there's any questions with regarding that one. Okay, so 16 C is abatement. Okay, no, I didn't have any questions on that one. Okay. 
And this one really was just kind of cleaning up the language, making sure we're referencing the correct Minnesota statutes, making sure that we include all of the sections of chapter five that we want to be able to abate and, and uh, cleaning up the process for issuing an abatement order. Um, I just, I actually looked at this really quickly, but I just want to make sure I understand. Um, so does this amended chapter 16C now allow us to abate for nuisances? I mean, before we were limited, but I didn't really see that in the application. If you look at section 16102, um, section A talks about the specific sections of chapter 5 that chapter 16C applies to. Okay. So the specific sections of chapter five that we can use the abatement process to handle. Okay. So that's kind of why we did 16C and chapter five together because we wanted to make sure that we're referencing the appropriate sections of chapter five within chapter 16C so that we can use the abatement process to handle those nuisances. And previously, specifically, um, we wanted to add section 5-300 from chapter five into this, and we did, and then we noticed there's a few other things we should change in the ordinance and as it happens, so. Okay. Ready for motion? Sure. So I would move to adopt ordinance 22-08, um, amending chapter 16C, violations abatement code as presented. This is Sue, all second. Any questions or discussion? I'll call for the vote. Shelley, aye. Sue, aye. Janet, aye. Jesse, aye. And then I would move to approve publication summary for ordinance 22-08 as presented. I'll second that. Any questions? I'll call the vote. Shelley, aye. Sue, aye. Janet, aye. Jesse, aye. Great. Thank you. On to five. So we'll move on to chapter five. This is our public nuisance and public safety chapter. There were 
There was pretty significant conversation and discussion with the council. Um, specifically, I believe it was our December 1st, around that time workshop. We really went through line by line and talked about all of the changes that we wanted to see. Um, I believe the most changes were made to section 5-300, just editing language. And there were also some considerable edits to section 5-500. <clears throat> Beyond that, we added sections regarding parking and vehicle storage and inoperable motor vehicles. Tonight before you, there is an extra handout that has additional language that um, Council Member Logren identified um, that we've included. So on section 5-300E, uh, there has been a sentence added saying that an animals chemically euthanized must be prior to burial stored in a way to prevent poisoning scavengers. And when animals are buried, they shall not be buried closer than 50, 50 feet from a, a well to kind of present, prevent um, any poisoning of a well. <clears throat> and then the other concern that we identified was on 5-300J as amended. We added the um, section J identifies decaying matter as a nuisance and we had added a note uh, including the exception of managed compost piles. And after some discussion, we wanted to further um, narrow that to uh, only compost piles that are located at least 100 feet from any property line uh, to prevent compost piles or piles of decaying matter piling up on a property line being excluded from the list of public nuisances. And I know, Shelly, those were your concerns specifically, so if you have anything to add on that, um, be happy to hear it or take any other questions from council members or mayor. <clears throat> so I don't have any questions. I know that we did review it a lot, and in my notes, everything is, has been changed, updated to what we talked about. Um, I did find one clerical. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's an error. Section 5-501B, no person shall place or throne on any street or right away. It should be throw, I think. Yep. That's an easy one. Got it. And actually, I had a question on that section, too, because it looked like it was redundant with what was already in 5-500Q and 5-500AA. Both of those things are already stated prior, so I wasn't sure if we needed to state them again. Well, this one talks about nails, bottles, and things like that, and Q. No, it's AA that has the nails, bottles, and... Mm -hmm. Which one? Um, AA. So 5-500 AA says the placing or throwing of on any street, sidewalk, or other public property of any glass tax, nails, bottles, or other substances that may injure any, any person or animal or damage any pneumatic tire when passing over such substance, which is pretty much the exact same wording that's mm -hmm. in this, this new one. And, and um, the leaves and dirt and sand is in 5-500Q. This expands more on it, but it is already, I mean, we should just have it in one place or the other, not both, I think. I would agree AA does look identical to 5501B. Um, question is maybe where, where it would be most appropriate to list. Um, 505, 5501 talks about the deposit of materials on city roads and streets is prohibited. Um, my gut would be to maybe cross out double A and leave it 
as Section 5 501B? That makes, that sense, makes sense to me. And then would you cross out 5500Q five, and leave A under 5501A? Five, Want to make sure that um, everything that was in Q is also in A. So. Does 501A talk about burning leaves, lawn clippings, et cetera? I think, I think your 501A is better. So I would leave that and I would just cross out Q from 500. Q does include burning leaves. Yeah, I've noticed that it doesn't, and then it's non not an clippings. A. Um, it seems maybe that 501A talks a little bit more about snow, plow, shovel, blow, or otherwise deposit of snow onto any road. It does not talk about burning leaves, weeds, lawn clippings. It, well, it does. It says no person shall deposit or permit to be deposited on any public road, street, or right away in the city of Columbus. Leaves, grass, sand, dirt, ash, or other mm -hmm. material. Right. Um, I, my intuition would be to add to 501A then lawn clippings and... Um, burning burning leaves. leaves specifically mm -hmm. and weeds because if we're going to cross off Q I want to make sure we're not taking anything away yep I think I think Q though is getting at you can't burn leaves not that you can't burn leaves in the street I think it's just saying you can't burn leaves right it's the throwing placing depositing or burning leaves um, on roads so Okay. Yeah. Throwing, placing, depositing, or burning. So it's those actions of doing that to leaves, trash, lawn clippings, weeds, grass. So it seems like it's a little bit of a different intent. I think the key is, though, it's in the road, because you can burn leaves on your property if you have a burn permit. <clears throat> so what I'm thinking is you might... You can just combine what combine them all, but how will we have it in one place? Yeah, Q would be added to five five right. one A and yeah. redundancy is deleted. Yep. Okay. We'll move Q down to five five oh one A. Um, I had a question on section five dash five hundred. It's more for Jim to answer. So I think I brought this up when we talked about it before. So right now it says, it change, it, we changed the snow and ice being removed from public sidewalks from 24 hours to 48 hours. I, we don't have any sidewalks other than the ones that you guys clear, right? right. So do you clear them in 48 hours? So you might not wanna have it as our ordinance if we can't follow it. <laughs> I think we, it's been a little while since I've looked at our snowfall policy, but I believe we address something about plowing sidewalks and things like that in some appropriate amount of time after a, a snowfall, so it's not our priority. Mm -hmm. um, I don't believe that we give it a timeline, though. So how do you want to handle that? Because I just feel like right now, the only only sidewalks that are public sidewalks are the responsibility of the city. As per the policy. Can we just refer to the policy? I think it, I, I would prefer to see a specific number. If you don't think it's 48, then make it 72. But I don't think you want it indefinite because it, there will come a time when somebody other than the city is plowing public sidewalks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we may not 
change this for 10 years or right. more. Right. So I think we pick a number that's reasonable. If it's not 48, 72, I wouldn't go much longer than that. So Just, what if I don't get it done in 72 hours? Well, then, you know, we're going <laughs> to issue you a ticket. <laughs> <laughs> And then, and then I'll just <laughs> add it in with the bills, and we're good. Right. <laughs> I, I think I think going much beyond that could create a hazard for yeah. yep. as we go forward. Let's say, you know, there's some development that has public sidewalks as a part of it. We want them to mm -hmm. to shovel those walks. Mm-hmm. No, if Jim's tardy. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'll leave it up to you guys to figure out what the right number is. But that was my concern, which I was I wanted to make sure 48 hours was still going to be livable for you. But it sounds like maybe not. We potentially don't get them done within 48 hours, but it depends on what's happening. I mean, if it snows for three days straight, we're not going to, our priority is not sidewalks at that point. Um, if you put 72 hours in there because we need a timeline, um, I may or may not achieve that, but it's always our intention to get to them as soon as possible. That makes sense. Let's, let's uh, lighten up to 72 and see if that works. Okay. And then I also had a question about compost piles. Should there be a size limit? I mean, I think it's great that we have, you know, a definition related to property lines, but um, I mean, I think most people compost have reasonable size compost, but you could have some gigantic <laughs> compost piles that are really smelly and nasty. And I don't see anything in here that kind of protects us against that. And I don't know what size you would choose, but I even think about, you know, um, people who have several horses, if they compost the manure, um, I, which is really good practice. I'm all for it. It's going to be big <laughs> and potentially smelly at first. So I don't know. I mean, I don't know what the right answer is. I'm just calling that out as... A, a hole. Would we be covered in any of the other uh, areas of the ordinance for smell? I didn't see that we would. But because, yes, I have seen a, a very large compost pile of um, horse manure, but it's it, it's not offensive if it's not close to your house, mm -hmm. and if it's not close enough to smell it, I mean, if you want to walk by it, then you take the risk of smelling it, but... Right. No, I, 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 I'm, again, I'm not against it at all. I just want to call it out, because we've had some complaints about smell of manure from people who are across the street from others that have large animals, and... You know, it's kind of, we haven't really had anything that we can do about it, and maybe we don't want to do anything about it, but we haven't really addressed it. And I was thinking about, I think, Elizabeth, you mentioned once that we had a business that had composting, and that was like a big nightmare. Um, that's because they um, introduced grass that was bagged and then into the pile, and mm -hmm. the ammonia scent wouldn't go away. Mm -hmm. And the neighbors were complained um, every time they turned the piles. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, that's why I'm bringing these things up. But I mm -hmm. don't have good answers for like how you define it so that it doesn't become a problem. If you define it by size, you define it by where it has to be. I don't know. Well, uh, two comments in the list of you know public nuisances. We specifically accept managed compact post piles, so we specifically allow them as not a nuisance. Mm -hmm. But then under O, oh, I think it's O, oh, all other acts, omissions, uh, occupations, uses of property, which are deemed by the council to be a menace to the health and inhabitants of the city are considered uh, numbered here or numbered there. So, you know, I, I guess if you have complaints, you've got, you've got a way to, to address it. It's pretty broad. But that, that would be kind of the catch-all for anything. Um, otherwise, we have to, I think we have to look into, the, you know, kind of the science of what's too big. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know that we're ready to do that here tonight. But, right. but I, I'm, I'm comfortable that O is the catch-all for anything where, where you get multiple complaints and, and there actually is a nuisance. Okay. Okay. Um, and then on Section 5-503, I guess, I wondered if we wanted to add... 
alarm systems only because there have been times where someone's home alarm system malfunctions and it goes off <laughs> and it doesn't go off, it doesn't stop. <laughs> and you know, if it happens once, it's one thing, but sometimes it happens multiple times because there's a short or there's something that's triggering it. So I, I didn't know if you wanted to add that to the list of noises that are problematic. A lot of people have alarm systems. Are you referencing specifically to in, in 503A1? Yes, and I would add, on, you know, in that list of radios, music devices, paging systems. Alarm systems? Yeah. It could be from a car, too. I mean, we've all been there where car alarms go off and they don't shut up. Um, and then I also wanted to know, I, I was just reading, um, I can't remember if it was Minneapolis or St. Paul, but they just passed an ordinance about drag racing because they had a big problem with that. And I can tell you in the summertime, you can hear people doing that here too. I don't know if they're here in Columbus or there in Forest Lake, but I can hear it very easily. Um, so I don't know. And the, and the whole reason for them putting an ordinance was enforcement. They couldn't do anything about it because there was nothing prohibiting it. So I don't, you can look to see what words they use, but we do have that going on here. <laughs> I think it was Blaine that actually that passed it because I think they were doing drag racing in the parking park and ride. They, parking I lots. think it was both. I, yeah. it was both places. Yeah, um, I that is something we would have to look into and read other cities' ordinances mm -hmm. to see how to bring that in here. I'm not prepared to add that in that language in tonight. So, um, if there's interest in doing that, I think we would pull this one off the agenda and look into that a little bit more. And bring or it adopt adopt this and, and put it on a work schedule. Yeah, yeah. So I think a lot of time has gone into this already, right? Yep. yep. Yeah, the alarm systems is an easy add uh, after paging systems. Mm-hmm. And let's see. I know that I know that this isn't something we were looking at, but. I was, when I looked at the curfew hours, I thought, who's going to tell a 16-year-old that they have to be home in bed at 10 o'clock? <laughs> I'm pretty sure that we need to do some work on this, too. Added for a reason. Yeah, we might have been asked by the sheriff's. Office well, I Jeff, yeah. Jeff asked for it too. Mm -hmm. I had to Does it say we have to make sure they're in bed? No. no. I, I, I added that. I added that. That's not in here. Okay. I just, I just know, and I know this was a long time ago, but when I was 16 years old, I was working graveyard shifts and, and bar rushes at restaurants, so there's no way I was going to be home at 10 o'clock. Just don't be wandering the streets of Columbus. Right. Well, I think it just gives them the ability, if they see a 16 year old on the street, after 10 o'clock, then they can tell them to go home. Well, I wasn't sure what present on any public street even meant. Like if they're driving, they're present on a public street. Well, I don't think they would cause them an issue if they weren't looking for drugs or hooking or something. I just hate, if they're on their I way hate home rules that are dumb, and this is one's dumb. <laughs> this just gives them the power to do something about it. Well, if they think they're hooking or selling drugs, I think they have reason enough to pull pull them over and address them then because they're on after 10 o'clock. It certainly would be easy to change all of the 10 o'clocks to 11 or 12 or whatever. Midnight but I, I do think this sheriff's deputy asked to have something like this in here because... Yeah, so, so he has some way to enforce it. Right, yeah. like, like the drag racing. If yeah, you know, if so maybe we can just look to see what... Okay, but I mean, the, th the thing is, we've had the teeping, we've had the ding-dong ditch or whatever it is and everything, and a lot of times that's by younger kids, and that's a, a, a tooth to put into it so that they can't do it, you know? And there are people that are really bothered by that. Look, go out and look at them next door, I mean. Well, then I'd lower the age, and I wouldn't say 16, because 16, they're working. They can be working, right? So there may be employment. I, I mean, I'd lay, lower it to 14 or 15 or something, and I don't know how old those kids are that are doing that kind of stuff, but... You know, as simple as adding the word loitering would change the whole meaning because if if you're that's moving right. in a vehicle, yeah, if you're you know, if yeah, you're if you're just over, hanging out in the park, that's right. a different deal. And that's what it's intended to do is loitering in the park after hours. Okay, 
Well, so let's add Which that word. none of us have ever done, right? No. <laughs> I never tweet anybody either. Oh. Can you um, point me to the specific section that we're talking about? Yeah. Uh, 5-801. It's on page 5-10. So instead of to be present, it would be to loiter? To loiter, yep. yep. That's all I got. Anything else? Anyone? Mr. Mayor and, and Council, just for clarity, since uh, Jessica is the drafter. I mean, I feel comfortable that we can adopt it with the changes that were addressed here tonight, but I just want to make sure that Jessica is as yeah. she's going to make the revisions. I can read them out real quick. So in 5-500A, we're changing the time to remove snow from a public sidewalk from 48 hours to 72 hours. Um, in 5-500Q is being struck and the exact language is being added to 5-501A. Um, and then double A from 5-500 is going to be struck because 5-501B is identical to it. We're adding alarm systems to the list of noise prohibitions under 5-503A1 and 5-801 is uh, the to be present language is being changed to loiter on any public street, avenue, park, or public place. And at 501B, it's throw versus thrown. Yeah. And then do we need to include Shelley's changes too? Or are they already? I think they were already they were in, in there. there. They were already in there. Mm -hmm. All right. All right. So I'll make the motion to adopt ordinance 22-09, amending public safety and public nuisance with the amendments just recited by Jessica. Is there a second? This is who I'll second. Any other questions or discussion? Can we just add a direction to staff to investigate the drag racing? Oh yeah. yeah. Sure, let's do it outside the motion though. Okay. It's not. It's a different, yep. okay. I'll call for the vote. Shelly, I. Sue, I. Janet, I. Jesse, I. And now you're and, going to... And I would just uh, direct staff to investigate um, language that we could be added later um, that would address drag racing as a nuisance. Got it. Thank you. Moving right along, engineer report. Uh, Mr. Mayor, we need one more motion. Oh. Sorry. Publication. Summary publication. So I'll make the motion to approve publication summary for ordinance 2209 as presented, but also, or not as presented, but including uh, the list that Jessica just recited. Is there a second? This is Janet, I second. I'll call the vote. Shelly, I. Sue, I. Janet, I. Jesse, I. No, engineer. Good evening, Mayor and uh, City Council members. Kevin Bittner, City Engineer. Just one quick update on projects. Our West Freeway Drive project is uh, winding down for the season this week. Um, the soil correction work that they were required to complete will be completed this week, and uh, the balance of the project will be completed uh, come spring so and summer. So everything's on schedule. Very good. Yeah, they're fortunate to be able to work until New Year's. That Had to dodge a few snowstorms, but uh, other than that, uh, they were benefited by the freezing temps, which uh, assisted in some of the excavation work, so. Good, good. Attorney's report. Ms. Mayor and Council, at your last meeting, we discussed uh, some direction for the legislative session. Um, I've had further conversations with Margaret Vessel and Grady Harn in our office. Um, we are happy to talk to leadership about uh, the bill that we submitted the last couple of years. Uh, we wouldn't give it much of a chance at this point, but we could be wrong. Uh, what we would really like to focus on is building a coalition for transportation funding for small cities. 
we've also worked on that each of the two sessions and based upon the change in leadership we think that has a better chance of passage i sent you some materials some background materials through e mail including a list of seven hundred and twenty two small cities that have the potential to benefit so one of the reasons we want to create kind of a coalition effort is not to have columbus carry the water for over seven hundred communities but to be part of the coalition um, <clears throat> as i discussed with elizabeth we would limit our work um, as we've done in past years to the months of january february and march uh, because in march are the, we have the committee deadlines and so if we don't have a bill submitted and heard by those committee deadlines we know pretty certainly that it's not going to go forward so the last two months of the contract would be voided out um, that's our proposal so our proposal is to work on small cities transportation funding in this legislative session to build a coalition to bear some of the cost and effort um, we would uh, have a three-month contract from january through march we would give you an update uh, margaret vessel would be here and give you an update in march um, how we're doing uh, we would also at the same time um, test the current leadership uh, newly elected leadership on the fiscal disparities issue um, the, the reason we think it it doesn't have much of a chance is we had republican um, leadership backing that as you know a concern about this community bearing and other communities bearing an unfair share of that fiscal disparities program uh, with democrats in charge and new um, legislators coming in it's a whole round of education um, and it's a whole round of kind of starting over uh, so that's why we wanted to focus on transportation funding because it crosses many communities some represented by democrats some represented by republicans um, it's a kind of a bread and butter issue because uh, since the constitution limits gas tax to communities over five thousand we never get that money and we there are some programs that you know kevin has been able to uh, use and, and some of our prior city engineers have used um, to kind of bring funding to this community but it's not it's not always consistent and so what we're looking for is a consistent you know call it a hundred thousand two hundred thousand two hundred fifty thousand a year coming to this community and other communities that that pay gas tax through their residents and through their businesses so that's the proposal um, we really need to to know um, you know start the, the session starts next week so we really need to know whether that's something you want to pursue if you want to have a, a year off from the legislature you know we certainly understand uh, but we've we've you have a good track record um, in in the past legislative sessions all of the bridge funding all of the road funding some of the work that's still going on with LRIP money is a result of your success in the legislature so that's that's my update and uh, just it's it's up to you whether you want to pursue something this session bill is a three months at ten thousand a month like it was in the past yep okay bill how do you feel that the excess money they're all sitting on is that a favor to us or a against us well it, it's um in in the past when we've brought these types of requests you know the the question has always been is there the money it, you know this year and going forward there's there's quite a bit of money mm -hmm. um you know typically when there's that much money they either give some of it back we'll see um they they put it towards one-time investments or one-time funding uh, again we'll see uh, but certainly it's easier to look at permanent fund we want a permanent funding source we don't want to have to kind of beg every year and so it's easier to make that request when there's 17 billion dollars you know sitting at the legislature they could even create an endowment if they wanted to you know just i don't think they will <laughs> but you know that's the sort of thing that they can get creative and and when you have I don't know that we would reach out to 722 communities that would just be kind of a nightmare to try and manage a coalition that large we would probably reach out to cities over 2,000 population and see if we can get uh, folks involved when you have that's still you know half this list um, and so when you have that many communities impacted in a positive way it really I think improves your chances whereas fiscal disparities as much as it is a bugaboo to us 
it mostly doesn't affect you know the rest of the state and even the metro area that where folks are net gainers and just for those listening the reason the reason we're not a net gainer as a city and it and it gets exacerbated as we develop is our population is relatively study steady that's one factor in the calculation and then the growth of commercial industrial in recent years is while it's a positive for the community it it tilts in it against us in terms of the fiscal disparities fund so there's it's a you know someday somebody's going to redo that fund but it's probably not going to be um you know one one small city leading the charge so i'm again margaret said you know she's happy to shop it to current leadership new leadership uh but but i i really if we're going to go up there on your behalf i'm i'm looking for a win so i'm looking for something that's meaningful for you and and others yeah. So if you, so you think it'll be about three months, would you know in the first month if, do you contact all those other cities and try to get whoever's going to be on board is going to be on board in that first month? Yes. The, the first step would be to talk to leadership about this idea and the authors that, that have um, brought forward the bill in the past to make sure they're on board. Make sure we have Democrats, um, either as a lead author or uh, certainly on the bill we want a bipartisan bill and th so that would be done in the month of january we would have a, a coalition building meeting in january we would want to drop a bill in february and we want to be heard by by march so there's a lot to do in in three months but we'd have a really good read for you by the end of march as they go into their um, breaks um, whether we've made any headway and then we would just you know if, if we feel like it's we're running into walls we would um you know Put a pause on and and not go through the end. Okay. Yeah. If I mean I'm I'm in favor of it if if you think you know that we have a chance. <laughs> <laughs> I do think we have a better chance with transportation funding than fiscal disparities. Yeah. But I like that you're going to still shop that fiscal disparities idea because it's just so egregiously wrong. Maybe there'll be somebody someday who will want to make it right for us, even if it doesn't mean changing the formula. Mr. Mayor and Council, and I think by doing that, it's kind of like, okay, if you can't fix this, then you need to work on transportation funding. Mm -hmm. Here, here's what's happening. We don't get LGA. We don't get, we're a net loser on fiscal disparities and we don't get gas tax. Yep. So, you know, it's a triple whammy for small cities, you know, with tight budgets and, you know, we don't have huge overhead. We don't have you know, the kind of departments that we see in larger cities. So do you just need direction to do that or do you want a motion? motion? Yep. Um, I can move, I can move um, to direct the city attorney to um, work for the next three months, January, February, and March um, with uh, his staff lobbyists to um, pursue a, a coalition for transportation funding for small cities and also um, test the waters um, with the leadership on fiscal disparities bill. I'll second it. Is there any questions or discussion? Shelley? I'll call the vote. I mean. Shelley, aye. Sue, aye. Janet, aye. And Jesse, aye. Ms. Mayor and Council, and, and well before that, I want to have Margaret come in and just give you her general legislative update, what's going on, kind of what's happening in the, in the session, and what they're going to do with $17 billion. Can't wait to hear that. <laughs> All right. Anything else, Bill? That's it for me. Thank you. Right. Okay. Uh, Mayor and City Council members report. Shelley? Well, I just wanted to say that this is my last meeting. I have enjoyed working with the council. It's been a privilege. Um, I'm really excited that our system works. We have people from various backgrounds that come together and we discuss things and we don't always get everything we want, but we get a lot of what we want and we get what the people of Columbus want. And I was, I was surprised, presently surprised that it does work and that's one of the reasons why I had run. Um, I just uh, want to let everybody know I've been to 388 meetings. 
<laughs> I counted them. <laughs> and it was, it was a huge learning curve, and I encourage anybody who wants to be on council to run for it and to understand the workings of city. Um, it's just been an amazing uh, journey, and I appreciate the planning commission, the council, and especially the staff. Thank you. I don't have anything except to thank Shelly for all of her service, for sitting next to me and helping me over the last two years learning, and uh, we'll miss you a lot because you have a really clear vision and thoughts about the way things should be done, and um, that's hard to come by, so we'll miss you. Um, I would echo what uh, Sue said, too. I mean, obviously, we sort of ran together. We've been on this journey for a long time, and um, I, I do appreciate your perspective. I don't always agree with it, and you don't always agree with mine, but that is what it's supposed to be, right? We are supposed to be representing various different viewpoints, and despite what some folks might think about you know, us all being a coalition and all thinking alike, it's clear that we do not, and... Um, and thank you for bringing that point of view to the council and being so steadfast in your commitment. I, I, I respect that tremendously. And what more can I say, Shelley? Everybody's already said it. Uh, so thank you for all the work and all the fun. And sorry, Ron. <laughs> <laughs> and also while we're thanking people this last Wednesday was the last meeting for Chris King from the Planning Commission she is retiring and Bob Behrens he is retiring and actually Ron is retiring off the Planning Commission and he'll be taking Shelley's seat in two weeks so it'll be a little bit of a change but not a complete one so that makes the transition easier and he's going to learn a lot, isn't he? Heavenly has your seat, Shelley. So anyway, thank you, Shelley. Thank you, everybody else. And let's move to the personnel committee report. Okay, so there's a report that you have in your packet. Um, the personnel committee's done some interviewing for both the planning commission and the um, economic. <laughs> Uh, development Authority. So I'll talk about the Planning Commission first. We um, had an applicant submit her, their, her interest in uh, serving on the um, Planning Commission. Her name is Bethany uh, Barrett, and um, we interviewed her. She submitted her application on the 12th of December. We interviewed her last week, or the week before I lose track now. Um, She's been in the community for only nine months. She's um, moved here from downtown St. Paul, but she's um, absolutely in love with Columbus and its rural um, feel, and she wants to get involved and be active in trying to um, maintain that. She's a professional photographer. She owns and operates two photography businesses, um, holds a bachelor's degree, um, and her entrepreneurial spirit and business acumen and critical thinking skills, I think, will be a really good um, asset to the Planning Commission. Um, I loved how she described herself. She says she is, a, she appreciates rules, but she's more of a spirit of the rule rather than a letter of the law rule follower. <laughs> so that will be interesting. Um, she absolutely knows. Uh, what the uh, role of a planning commissioner is. So it'll be interesting to have that perspective be brought to, to their group. Um, she has some flexibility in her work schedule. Um, she knows what the time commitment is and she's willing to take that on. And um, she has a, a high sense of curiosity and a need to understand things, which I think will serve her well in this capacity. So with that introduction, I would like to um, recommend the appointment of um, Ms. Bethany Barrett to the Columbus Planning Commission to fill um, the position that actually was Bob Barron's. I think in my report I put Chris King. It was Bob Barron. So it would be to appoint her to the Planning Commission to fill a one-year term ending on December 31st, 2023, which is what um, Bob had left of his term. We'll second the motion. Any questions or discussion? We'll call for the vote. Shelley, aye. Sue, aye. Janet, aye. Jesse, aye. 
-hmm. And then moving right along, we also um, received an application from uh, Ms. Karen Fleming um, for the Economic Development Authority. She is um, a current resident in Columbus, lives in the Prino Preserve um, neighborhood. She grew up here in Columbus, has family that has lived here and now is back. She's worked for the past 40 years in the um, credit union business and um, 20 some, 15 years of those, no, 20 some years of those, she was the CEO for a credit union. She's also served on some boards of directors. Um, she has a real interest in helping um, Columbus attract and retain its businesses. And um, she, uh, describes herself as independent, self-driven, highly organized, um, with a genuine commitment to the position. And I know her a little bit, and I would say those are very accurate descriptors of her. Um, so with that in mind, she would fill the currently vacant position that is on the EDA that's been vacant for, I don't know, several years now. Um, and with that, then I would move uh, to a point uh, Ms. Karen Fleming to the Economic Development Authority to fill a six-year at-large position ending on December 31st, 2030. Oh. I'll second the motion. Any other questions or discussion? I'll call for the vote. Shelley, aye. Sue, aye. Janet, aye. And Jesse, aye. And that's, um, the only other thing I was going to mention is that we still do have a couple of applications for the Planning Commission that we'll be setting up interviews after the first of the year. Um, and with our fingers crossed, we will, we will get another, another person appointed. Thank you, Janet. Yep. Public Works, Jim. No report, Mr. Mayor. Uh -huh. Public Communications Coordinator report. No report for me this evening. Thank you. Assistant City Administrator report. Okay, so Mayor and Council, you have a memo from myself in your packet this evening, or in the additions this evening, regarding the potential sale of Howard Lake Park. I think my memo calls it Howard Lake Drive Park, which is not correct, but regardless, this is the parcel or parcels of land on the south side of Howard Lake Drive, uh, which was used to be a park and was uh, closed down, I believe in 2018, 2019, 18, 18 um, after a recommendation from the park board to do so. At the time, if you recall, we actually did do a, a survey online to d determine how much the park was visited by members of the community. And there was kind of an overwhelming response that uh, a lot of people don't use that park. And part of the reason was access. You know, there's not a parking lot there. There is not a really significant shoulder on Howard Lake Drive for people to park. So um, for, for a, a number of reasons, the park was closed down. And the lot lots, I believe there's two lots. Elizabeth, can you? Are you um, aware of that? If, if we look on GIS, yes. there's two lots. Yeah. Two lots. So there's two lots there that currently sit vacant. And if you also recall, we previously went through a whole process of selling the Haggard Park land. And we, uh, ever since we started that process, knew that we were going to um, embark on the same journey to sell the Howard Lake Park land. And this memo just describes the first step in that process, which would be having the city council um, ask the planning commission to review the sale of the property as a residential lot and essentially just confirm that it complies with the city's comprehensive plan and prepare a report back to the council um, stating just that. So this is just the first step in the process. Um, I'd be happy to, to discuss any, any other aspects of this if you'd like at this time, but this memo is just to kind of get the process going. So I'll make the motion to direct the Planning Commission to begin the review process for the sale of Howard Lake Park. Is there a second? Yep, this is Sue, I'll second. Are there any questions about it or we all kind of know right where it is. And I think a lot of us were around when it was decommissioned. So I'll call for the vote. Shelley, aye. 
Sue, aye. Janet, aye. And Jesse, aye. That's all I have tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Jessica. Mr. Mayor and Council Members, I, we have to go. We have to go back because I, I, I'm looking at my notes and the math isn't adding up. So we need to go back to the appointment of um, Karen Fleming. So this is the situation we're in. We have two at large, at large seats. There are six-year terms. They're staggered, so they're one year apart. You know, so one one term ends, the following year, then the next one ends. I was a year ahead of myself here. <laughs> one of the terms ends 12-31-2023, and the other one ends 12-31-2024. So Ms. Fleming would have to take over a term for either two years or one year, and then you would have to reappoint her for a six-year term. Which is probably a much more palatable option for her. <laughs> I, I <laughs> Try was, it on for size first. <laughs> I was getting way ahead of myself adding six years because I was so like 20, 30. We had an applicant. <laughs> so Mr. Mayor, the, you would need a motion to reconsider and then pass that and then you'd reconsider the motion and, and amend it. All right, I'll make a motion to reconsider. Is there a second? This is Janet, I second. I'll call for the vote. Shelly, aye. Sue, aye. Janet, aye. And Jesse, aye. Now, do we want to pin her to a one year or a two year? Did she say? Do you remember when you interviewed her? We did her? not get into that with yeah. her. Oh, okay. Well, let's go for two. Well, then you can leave the other motion intact because that was for the one year term. No, the other that was for the planning commission. Yep. This is the this oh, is the EDA right. where we EDA. we had her on going into the next decade. Oh, right, right. <laughs> got it, got it. All right, so you can make the motion then. So it's fill a two-year term. Okay, so I make the motion to uh, approve. What's her name? Karen Pam? Fleming. Karen Fleming to a two-year term for the EDA. I'll second the motion. Any other questions? I'll call for the vote. Shelly, aye. Sue, aye. Janet, aye. Jesse, aye. Thank you for catching that, Elizabeth. Karen <laughs> probably getting, thanks was, you too. <laughs> yeah, really, I was way ahead of myself there. Um, All right, administrator's report. Okay. Um, I have two things on um, my report. First one is the local board of appeal and equalization. We received a letter from the county indicating that once again it's time to choose dates, and the dates must fall between Monday, April third, um, and and May twelfth. We generally give them two dates, and then they choose from the date them those dates um, as to which one they can cover um, for our, our meeting. In looking at page 10 um, of the agenda packet, um, the council members, at least one council member has to be trained. We do have one council member trained. My recommendation is that um, all council members go through the training. I think it's a really good class to go through. Um, so Ron, if uh, you want me to send the information, I'll certainly send information to you to um, go through that training. And for those, um, the training is only good for three years, and then you have to take the class over again. So I will certainly send out um, the information for that. So dates that we're looking at. We usually do it on a non-council night. So what about a Tuesday? Tuesday works. Um, your workshop is uh, the second Tuesday, so you would just not pick a second Tuesday of the month. Yeah, I don't have any, any data is fine with me as long as it's not a Monday. So you have the 18th, the 25th of April, and then the 2nd and 9th of May. How about we shoot for the 18th and the 9th, so we don't get up against the deadline for any reason, in case we get a snowstorm. <laughs> but they will, they'll choose the day for us then, once no. we submit. Um, correct, so your first choice is April 18th and the second choice is May 9th. 
Unless anybody has any objections, that's fine with me. Mm, it's fine with me. Just two dates. For whatever reason, my calendar is in 2016, so I need to get into the right year here. April 18th. Well, how appropriate, April 18th is tax day. We'd oh, be having our LD. No, that's not on my calendar. It says tax days on April 18th, 2023. Hmm. Well, whatever. That's what that's what the iPhone says, and or May 9th. Mm. Yeah, because the 15th is Saturday. Yep. Then we get two extra days. Don't we have a? Do we not have a workshop on May 9th? The work that would be a workshop night. You'd have to have the workshop, and then you'd have to break out of the workshop and go to the. You would have to convene as the local board of appeal and equalization at that point. But didn't you say you didn't want it on a workshop night? Well, it's, you know, it's hmm. whatever you whatever you think is works. Well, how long does that meeting go? I can't remember. Depends on how many people show. Depends up. how many. Yeah. I mean, it would be kind of nice to have it on a night when we're already here. And we Unless can it gets to be we, too much. I mean, we could certainly do that. You know, we can say we're only going to take one presentation, and then we're going to do the local board of appeal. If that's the date that they choose. Oh, let's do that. Okay. And you you want it, you want the, um, so if our workshop starts at 5.30, do you want to start at 6.30? Do you want it to start at 7? What time do you want the start time? 6.30 is good for me. That leaves one room for one presentation, and then we can convene as a local board. That'll work. Right. The um, second item on, on my report, if we look at the additions, um, it's uh, good news for, for Jessica as she's, she's moving on to her, her new career. Sad for Columbus because she did give us our, re her resignation. Um, and then she'll be leaving us this coming Friday. But um, I'm certainly happy for her. It's it's really rewarding to see people to go on and do the career that they want to do, um, and and work through it. So um, I'm happy for her that she's moving on to her her new career. Congratulations. congratulations. Yeah, congratulations. I'm sad though, <laughs> and I didn't see the I didn't see the resignation letter. Does it does it say on there where you're going? I'm going to an intellectual property law firm in downtown Minneapolis. Ooh, okay. So, yeah, I am, it's been a pleasure to work here past six years. It seems like time just really flew by. And I've been so fortunate to be able to attend law school while working here at the city of Columbus. And that's all thanks to Elizabeth working with me. And I didn't know that I wanted to be a lawyer until I came to a council meeting and saw kind of, you know, what Bill does here and what the team does as, as attorneys. So um, I'm grateful for the opportunity and for how much I've learned. And I will miss it here. Columbus is a unique and special community and I'm grateful to have been welcomed to it and for the amount that I've learned and the people I've met. So thank you. So I'll make the motion to accept the resignation letter from Jessica Hughes. We wish her the best in her new career. Is there a second? This is Janet, I second. I'll call for the vote. Shelley, aye. Sue, aye. Janet, aye. Jesse, aye. And I will excuse myself for one minute and I'll be right back. Oh. All right, while she slips away, we will uh, look at our calendar of announcements and reminders. Planning Commission meeting is on the 4th. And remember, our meetings all start at 6 o'clock from here on out. Uh, City Council workshop is on the 10th. That starts at 5.30. EDA at 5 on the 11th. City Council meeting on the 11th at 6. And the whole calendar is on the back. And since we're but the end the times of the page, are wrong on the calendar. Oops. So On the back page. But it's right on here. All right. Then what I'll do is make the motion to adjourn. Let's uh, let's not adjourn. So then um, you'll still be in a public meeting. Otherwise, you oh have to scatter. Oh, oh All right. okay. <laughs> then hold that, Shelley. This is for you. Mm -hmm.
who's only four years. It's <laughs> <laughs> only one day. <laughs> I know, but Jeff, you know, Jeff was, <laughs> thank you. You have to open it up while we watch. Oh, no. Right. <laughs> this is like Christmas. <laughs> oh, I'm afraid. <laughs> Don't be afraid. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Open. You're in the oh, mic. No. <laughs> Little Santa. Just like Christmas, see? Yes. I'm a big Christmas person. When you excuse yourself, I should have run. <laughs> It's a, a plaque that recognizes my service. Thank you. <laughs> and a picture of my husband getting to sleep with a politician. <laughs> Thank you very much. Well, that was your inauguration day. Yeah. <laughs> We're sad you didn't let us put it on the billboard, Shelly. That's really what I wanted was a picture I, of you I, underneath the billboard with your big thank you and lights. Yeah, no. <laughs> That's okay. And Mr. Oh. Mayor, not to be too much of a Scrooge, you can adjourn the meeting and re have refreshment. So uh, that's covered by the open meeting law. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll make the motion to adjourn. Is there a second, Shelly? I'll second it. All right. And I'll, and I'll say aye. <laughs> I'll call for the vote. For the last time. All right. Aye. Janet, aye. And Jesse, aye. Again, thank you. The meeting's adjourned. Record.